Abdul Aziz was king of Saudi Arabia for 51 years until 1953, and his son Saud was king for 11 years until 1964. But unlike his father, Saud was incompetent, and gradually his younger brother Faisal acquired more and more power. By 1962, Faisal ruled the kingdom, and Saud was just a figurehead. But Saud fumed, I am not Queen Elizabeth, and in 1964 he tried to get his power back. But the family resisted him and kicked him out of the country, and Faisal became king. Ever since, the Saudi throne has passed from older brother to younger brother, to the eldest able among Abdul Aziz's 43 sons. The current king is Abdullah, the 13th of the 43 sons. In my opinion, Abdullah has been an excellent king. Perhaps his greatest achievement was pushing the kingdom to become the 149th nation to join the World Trade Organization in 2005. To join the WTO, there were 7,000 tariffs that were negotiated, and Saudi Arabia had to sign 38 trade agreements and pass 42 new laws to make its regulations conform to global standards of arbitration, anti-piracy, fiscal transparency, and judicial procedure. All this has made Saudi Arabia a much safer place to invest, and foreign investment tripled in 2006 and 2007. And as the Saudi people grow more prosperous, better educated, and more widely traveled, they are also becoming more open to new ideas about religious tolerance and gender equality. In the words of one prince who owns a high-tech dairy farm outside of Riyadh that employs hundreds of Saudi women, Economic reform is the chariot that will drive all the other reforms. Abdullah has been a good king, but unfortunately he is almost 86. And Sultan, the 16th son who is the crown prince, is almost 85 and fighting cancer, and probably a losing battle with cancer. The next son who is the eldest able is 76, and the one after that is 73. Saudi Arabia is suffering from what some call the Chernenko syndrome, the the bedevilment that, that uh, ailed the Soviet Politburo in the 1980s when Leonid Brezhnev died at 76 was followed by Yuri Andropov who died just two years later who was followed by the even more sickly Konstantin Chernenko. To rescue Saudi Arabia from this predicament, King Abdullah has created a brand new body and if Sultan dies soon, this body may meet very soon. It's called the Allegiance Institution which will choose a new crown prince the next time there's a vacancy. Each filial branch of Abdul Aziz's family has a representative in this body. Currently, it consists of 16 sons and 19 grandsons of the founding king. So apart from Crown Prince Sultan, no one in the future will be able to become king of Saudi Arabia without first securing support from the next generation of Saudi princes, the grandsons of the founding king. Today, almost every Saudi watches satellite television, and there are more than 370 Arabic language TV channels. Saudi, women see, uh, Leb Saudi people see Lebanese women shaking their hips to Arab music, and talk shows where female scholars skillfully cite verses of the Quran to refute the views of conservative male clerics. The impact of satellite TV is profound because the programs that Saudi women watch include soap operas produced in Beirut and Cairo, programs that show good, virtuous Muslim women driving cars, working with men, and running their own businesses. I asked a colleague at the King Faisal Center for Research in Islamic Studies, where I was a visiting scholar, if he thought satellite television would change the way women will live in Saudi Arabia, and he said it will change everything. 60% of the Saudis watch Western television too, including translations of Disney cartoons and programs. Other popular shows include Star Academy, which is a copy of American Idol, and it's a program that's acclimating millions of young Arabs to, the, to voting. Saudis also watch Who Will Win a Million? and Al Shamshun, a remake of The Simpsons where Omar goes to a coffee shop instead of to Moe's Bar. Those who understand English also watch Friends and Sex in the City, and there are translations of numerous police shows and many movies also. The Lebanese Broadcasting Corporation, which is 49% owned by Saudi Prince Awalid, has three channels geared to different age groups. Rotana Clip, the network um, that's especially popular with teenagers, takes the text messages of the teenagers and then rebroadcasts the text messages underneath music videos. 
Now, as you know, for four years, the price of oil was quite high. It was a function of accelerating Chinese demand for oil that collapsed only with the current recession. During this time, many people have talked about the need for energy independence. But even if America becomes energy secure by finding new sources of energy, it may never become energy independent because no matter what sources of fuel Americans use in the future, so long as we are dependent on Asia for its manufactured goods, we will be dependent on the Middle East for its oil. True energy independence, at least in the next few decades, is a myth. During the recent oil boom, not only have the Saudis prospered, but Iran has also had plenty of money to spend. The Iranians, as you know, have built high-speed centrifuges to extract radioactive uranium gas from non-radioactive uranium gas, a process called enrichment. But the rotors in these centrifuges must spin 180,000 times a minute. If anything goes wrong, a flying rotor does a lot of damage. The Iranian approach has been to build thousands of centrifuges, 4,000 at last count, then fill them with only moderate amounts of gaseous uranium. It's a more expensive way to enrich uranium, but it gets the job done. Iran has enough partly enriched uranium for an atom bomb now, and it will probably be able to build an atom bomb early in the next decade. In 1981, when Israeli jets destroyed Iraq's nuclear reactor in the town of Osirak, Iraq had just that one reactor. Iran, by contrast, has widely dispersed its nuclear facilities. And Iran is also huge. It is the size of the American South, east of Texas. So think of everything from here to Lake Charles, Louisiana. And it is mountainous to boot. The idea that a few surgical airstrikes can destroy Iran's nuclear program is naive in the extreme. As for diplomacy, it has been six and a half years since dissidents first revealed the existence of Iran's enrichment program, yet Iran continues to avoid serious negotiations on this subject. We must therefore be wary. Any trade concessions that Iran's hardliners win from the West will be gobbled immediately like a piece of chocolate on the assumption that any long-term commitment they make in return can be renegotiated later. The Saudis are frightened by the prospect of an Iranian bomb, but they don't want war either. For one thing, the water desalinization plants are highly vulnerable to attack. War against Iran is also unnecessary because Israel already has a nuclear deterrent, a clear second strike capability against an Iranian nuclear attack. Israel's five submarines are diesel fueled, but they carry nuclear missiles, and two of these submarines are operational at all times. Short of war, the world has only two points of leverage with Iran, one short term and one long term. First, Iran refines only 60 to 70 percent of its gasoline. It imports most of the rest from India, France, Turkmenistan, and the United Arab Emirates. This gives us a hold over Iran's economy should we need it. But in order to maintain that hold, the Chinese and the Europeans must agree not to build a gasoline refinery in Iran. Build pipelines, fine. Build petrochemical plants, fine. Build subway systems for Tehran, fine, but not refineries. Second, Iran's oil production of four million barrels a day is stagnant. Iran's geologists and engineers can offset the decline of aging fields, but they cannot increase their nation's oil production. Iran's 75 million people use 37% of their country's oil, and their oil consumption is almost doubling every decade. By 2020, Iran's oil exports may fall in half, and by 2030, Iran may have no surplus oil left to export. If we can get the Chinese and the Europeans to promise not to help Iran increase its oil production, then we will have a long-term plan to bring down Iran's theocracy by depriving it of money. It is in China and Europe's interest to agree to this rather small concession in order to avoid a disastrous war that would cut off their oil supplies. They can still buy all the Iranian oil and all the natural gas from Iran they want. In a region as dangerous as the Middle East, the United States is fortunate to have a close ally in Saudi Arabia. Most of us, when we think of allies, we think of countries we share values with, such as Britain and Canada and the Netherlands. Obviously, Saudi Arabia, as a Muslim and gender-segregated society, does not fit this mold. But should the United States only have allies in North America and Western Europe? Don't we need an ally in a region as hostile as the Arab world? 
The Saudis worship the same God we do. Allah is merely Arabic for God. And they even believe in the miracles and the resurrection of Jesus. They are also capitalists and they really do oppose terrorism. To cite cultural differences, however great, as a reason to end our alliance with the Saudi Kingdom makes no sense when the prospect of another government friendlier to the U.S. taking power there is nil. The Saudis did not know 9-11 was going to happen any more than we did, and since then they have made many, many changes. The 15 Saudis who hijacked airplanes and killed almost 3,000 Americans on 9-11 are not representative of the Saudi people, the Saudi royal family, or even the Saudi clergy. America's 65-year friendship with Saudi Arabia therefore needs to be nurtured, not censured. And now I'd be happy to answer questions.